It's a privilege to be preaching once again at Holy Trinity, and thank you for having me back. It goes without saying that it's hard to believe one year later we're still in a similar situation as last summer, but hopefully that won't be the case much longer. Hopefully. Well, today we're continuing to look at John chapter 6 as the lectionary really focuses on this chapter for a number of weeks during year B of the three-year cycle. We've read and heard about Jesus feeding the 5,000, the crowds looking for him. Today, we'll look at the beginning of the dialogue between Jesus and the crowd, which continues on past today's passage. We'll also explore some of the texts from Ephesians, keeping in mind this theme of God's grace and our invitation to continue Christ's ministry. After being fed and satisfied the previous day, the crowd goes looking for Jesus, and they find him on the other side of the sea. Oh, Rabbi, when did you come here? They ask Jesus. Jesus knows the people's hearts and why they seek him, not because they've interpreted and understand the signs, but because their bellies were filled. I was reading a commentary that said in 19th century China, and perhaps other places in Asia, there was a name for people who came to church because they were hungry for material things. They converted, were baptized, joined the church, and remained active members so long as their physical needs were met through the generosity of the congregation. But once their prospects improved and they and their families no longer needed rice, they drifted away from the church. And so some missionaries refer to them as rice Christians. And I don't mean for that to sound like a derogatory term or something xenophobic, but rather to highlight a historical example of people coming to church, coming to the body of Christ, only so long as it met their needs. It was a similar situation in East Germany and Romania before the liberation of Eastern Europe. The people came to cheer the church and pastors speaking out against communist regimes. But after liberation from the Soviet Union and local dictators, the crowds dispersed and the churches began to look as abandoned as they had been before the stirrings of political liberty took hold. We know the crowds that followed Jesus to Capernaum to find him aren't unique. They're there for their own physical, temporary benefit. Jesus tells the people, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. What Jesus is trying to convey to the people is don't focus on food which only satisfies you for a short while. Focus on me, the one who can provide eternal life through God. The crowd asks Jesus how they know they can trust him. Why should we believe that God sent you? What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? It seems absurd, right? Jesus, just having fed 5,000 people, these very ones want a sign that Jesus is sent from God. Not to mention that verse 14 in the same chapter states, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Maybe John, as the writer of the gospel, is trying to convey something between the lines. In any case, the people's Long-term memory or biblical knowledge is pretty good because they reference, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus corrects their understanding. It wasn't Moses who gave the bread. It was God the Father, the one who gives you the true bread from heaven, which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, not rabbi this time, but, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And that's where we stop for today. But perhaps next week you'll continue with this passage. The Gospel of John is filled with various I am references by Jesus. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and some others. Each metaphor describing or portraying something about Jesus, 
But what does bread of life mean? Over time and through familiarity with the Christian faith, these words become familiar, especially in our Eucharistic prayers and in the liturgy for the breaking of bread after the Lord's Prayer. But how do we understand this metaphor when we read it or hear it? How do you think someone less familiar with these words might react if they heard them? In the first century, some people identified the early Christians as incestuous cannibals, people who called each other brother and sister, even their own spouses, and they'd gather early in the morning to drink blood secretly. It sounds pretty strange, doesn't it? Now, if technology cooperates, there's a brief clip from Bishop Michael Curry that I think is particularly helpful as we continue exploring John 6. I think sometimes a passage looked at from the context of the grand sweep actually takes on meanings that it doesn't just by itself. Um, and I, f- I have found that helpful in the seasons of Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter is easy. Pentecost, that ordinary time, is a little bit more difficult until you look at the passages that the lectionary has actually called for. And you may discover that there actually are subterranean themes, not every week, but they're there in the grand sweep of the the season. Uh, There's there's one point at which we get John, the bread of life. Um, There's that hymn, uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. One of the old versions of that, um, um, uh, the refrain was something like, feed me till I want no more. Well, in those summers where we get John 6 and the bread of life over and over again, you want to sing that hymn, feed me till I want no more. Um, but if you look at that bread of life um, as part of a bigger whole that's going on in the season of Pentecost, how is it that God is trying to feed the world not on fast food but on gourmet that gives life? How is it that, that, that God is really trying? Uh, you know, we talk about food deserts. Um, 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 communities where people can't get, um, where good and healthy um, food and sometimes locally grown foods are not readily available. And so we wonder why people in the poorest areas gain a lot of weight because they're eating the stuff that's not good, but that's what's readily available. Well, guess what? There are food deserts all over this world. And there are food deserts where there is plenty and food deserts where there is possible po- poverty. How is it that the bread of life is trying to feed folk? Well, look at those passages in light of that grand sweep, that grand work of God, and all of a sudden the passages that come along the way, not not just the John 6 ones, may actually be uh, working on how God is trying to feed us with food that gives life. How is it that God is trying to feed the world, not on fast food, but on gourmet food that gives life. When we take these verses along with the previous ones in John 6, we begin to recognize a bigger picture and just what is at stake here, that God would send Jesus to us, the bread of life, to show us how important we are to God and how much God loves us. Jesus offers his very self, his own flesh and blood. Everything that he has is given for our nourishment. And perhaps even still hearing Christ's body being nourishment for us still sounds kind of strange. It doesn't fit with our reasoning or understanding, and it also might sound kind of just a little bit gross, more like cannibalism than Christianity. But in Jesus, God takes on flesh. In Jesus, we have the bread of life. And in the sacraments, we meet God, who gives all that God has to offer so that we might encounter God and believe and enjoy God's presence forever. If we interpret the text this way, then we see Jesus giving us everything that he has for our sake. Here the wholeness of God meets the wholeness of us and the entirety of humanity. That is what is at the center of our reading. God is willing to do anything to get the message across that God loves us and wants us to believe in him. After sending prophets, laws, judges, commandments, God enters into the world as Jesus and gives us all that he has. And in order to get his message across, Jesus uses all sorts of metaphors and analogies to let us know about this love and care. Jesus as the bread of life was the way that God was trying to feed the world, not on fast food, 
but on gourmet food that gives life. And as believers in Christ, we recognize that Jesus is the bread of life. Whoever comes to Jesus will never be hungry, and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. It'll be nice when we can celebrate the Eucharist in the physical presence of one another again, particularly because it's a reminder of the promise which God makes to us in the sacraments, to be one with us forever, to accompany us in all times and in all situations, no matter what. When we take part in this heavenly bread, there is a much richer meaning and experience of unity, closeness, and oneness with God. Part of me is tempted to stop here because I usually preach um, a little bit shorter, and um, I think I'll continue, though, while I, I did write more, but I don't want to let us off the hook so easily. And I don't want to come across as telling you what to do or make it sound like you as listeners or Holy Trinity are not doing enough because that's not my intention. Uh, my spiritual tension, both uh, individually and when preaching to parishes or congregations, is this balance or recognition between grace and action. I don't think any of us would argue that it is through Christ that we are saved, and He is the source of our hope and our salvation. But many of us tend to just recognize that and kind of plateau in our faith. It's important to know and experience God's love for us, but God loves the whole world, not just us. God sent Jesus to the world, not just for us. And we as the church, as the body of Christ, have a ministry to continue. Not the salvation part or the judging part, but pointing others towards Christ and helping others experience God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in their lives and communities. Let's keep in mind John 6 while we look at our passage from Ephesians. We've talked about the Eucharist a bit, and here we see Paul describing baptism. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And Paul says that each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. All of us have something. No one has nothing. And he states that it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. I've always been kind of perplexed by that statement, um, taking captivity captive. But a theologian I listened to quoted James Stewart of Scotland, and I found a new appreciation for this phrase. James Stewart writes, It is a glorious phrase that our Lord led captivity captive. The various triumphs of his foes, it means he used for their defeat. He compelled their dark achievements to subserve his ends, not theirs. They nailed him to the tree, not knowing that by that very act, they were bringing the world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gates to die, not knowing that at that very moment they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king of glory come in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of people the very name they intended to destroy. They thought they had God with his back to the wall, pinned and helpless and defeated, they did not know it was God himself who had tracked them down to that point. He conquered not in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. He conquered not in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. Christ has gifted his church so that some women and men would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip God's people for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. God has given us gifts not to be kept to ourselves, not for us to be content that God loves us and that's the end of the story. It would be easier for us for sure, but that's not what God has in mind. We are meant to grow, to mature, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We're not meant to go backwards or stay where we're at. There's a, a pretty simplistic picture that you'll see soon that shows various stages of growing up. 
Maturing over time means growth in various ways. I was very fortunate to be blessed with a lovely childhood. There are times when I reminisce, when I miss being at home with my parents and siblings, when I didn't have to cook or clean or work that much or that hard. But I can't go back in time. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Even if the future is uncertain and scary, even if it seems promising and hopeful, we're meant to continue. We're meant to grow in faith as well until we're united with Christ. Each of us has a role to play in Christ's church. We are joined and knit together, as Paul says, equipped, each part working properly, to promote the body's growth in building itself up in love. To grow in love, to reach one more person, to take one more step, and to keep growing, to love more people, and to take more steps. As a community of faith and as Christians on our personal faith journeys, I'll wrap up soon, but in thinking about Jesus as the bread of life and our call as Christians and Christ's church to continue his ministry, we don't exist for ourselves. We are meant to go out to love and serve. Remember, the manna that came down from heaven to feed the Israelites in the wilderness couldn't be hoarded. Aside from the Sabbath, the manna would spoil the next day. And as Scott mentioned in the the children's time, um, the Lord's Prayer emphasizes, give us this day our daily bread. It wasn't meant to be kept and accumulated, just something for today. Now, inasmuch as Jesus, the bread of life, is far better than the manna, which only satisfied temporarily, I think we need to remember that we do not have a monopoly on God. We don't own God. We belong to God and are invited to partner with him in his ministry of wholeness and reconciliation for the world. God loves us and the world, that God is trying to feed the world not on fast food, but on gourmet food that gives life. And we're invited to be conduits of that feeding, something like line cooks with God as chef, preparing food that gives life in a world that offers food that may fill temporarily, but cannot satisfy. Here's a picture for fun. And maybe as we get closer to lunchtime, it gives you some thoughts. I have to confess, I love uh, burgers, and particularly in summer, I'm always looking for good spots to get burgers and milkshakes. Uh, Maybe you can suggest some uh, recommendations in the chat, and I'll look at them afterwards. I haven't uh, been able to find a good spot for muffins yet, so as we're talking about um, food or breakfast foods that we enjoy, um, so if you know a bakery or somewhere that makes uh, good chocolate chip muffins, I'd appreciate those suggestions too. Um, But back to the real message. The world offers a lot of this kind of food. You know, it can look good and seem appetizing, but we know it's not really good for us. God wants to feed the world with good food and invites us, calls us to feed others too. Let's not become content or satisfied with only eating the Eucharist and experiencing God's grace for ourselves. May we find ways to employ our gifts in God's service to mature, to grow, to help others see God's activity in the world today, feeding and nourishing in myriad ways. And as Holy Trinity thinks about reopening and resuming in-person worship, let's consider the ways that we can use our gifts when we gather again to serve and build up God's body, the, the, God's church, the body of Christ. You know, Jesus fulfilled his ministry and calling as God's beloved son. It didn't bring him or the early church material prosperity, but it did transform the world. And hopefully, as we begin in-person worship, our focus will not be on pleasing Christians concerned with having their temporal needs met, but on making disciples who are concerned with making God's kingdom a reality. There's a a phrase or a quote from uh, JFK that I think is, I've always liked to adapt, I think, Um, JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I think as the church, sometimes we're focused on our own needs, and particularly during COVID, we certainly miss worshiping together and being in one another's presence. And it's not something to overlook, but as we think about being together once again, 
Let's not ask what our church can do for us. Let's ask and explore what we can do for our church. How can we build up Christ's body so that others can be fed? Let's end with that thought, and um, let me pray for us together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you that he is the bread of life, and we have been filled and satisfied spiritually so that we will never be hungry again. Lord, you know there are many people in the world surrounded by that which does not satisfy, which does not fulfill. Help us as your church to continue in Christ's ministry of healing and wholeness for a world that is in deep pain and need. May we find ways to feed people that nourish them, that help them experience your love and grace. Help us to use the gifts that you have entrusted to us so that others might know you in their lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.